Is it possible to rewire your brain? Okay, today we're gonna get into some brain science, so stick with me through the science that will create the context for some powerful tips that you get right toward the end. Question that sometimes comes up, is it possible to rewire your brain? Okay, first of all, folks, your brain is not an electronic instrument. There are actually no wires in your brain, but I know what they're talking about because we can think of wiring as the way that our, our brain operates with the neurons. Those might be kind of equivalent to a wiring system. Neurons talk to each other through a chemical electrical stimulus. And when those neurons repeatedly talk to each other in the same way, it sets up something that we sometimes refer to in the industry as a neural pathway. Think of it as the cruise control or the autopilot for your brain. So whatever we repeatedly do gets programmed in or wired into a neural pathway. For example, there are some things that you do without even thinking about it. Walking into a room, drinking a glass of water, tying your shoes. Think of some of these things that you do very naturally and automatically and you don't even think about it. Walking, for example, that is one of the most complex activities that we can engage in. It requires the coordination of a number of muscle groups all at the same time so that you can keep your balance, shift your weight just right, and not fall on your face in the process. That's an enormously complex task, and you can do it just like that without even thinking. Your brain is still in charge of that activity, but different parts of your brain do different things. So this is your brain. I'm a psychologist, not an artist. Give me a break. But this is a schematic of what your brain might look like. Side view, we've taken away all of the outer stuff, so we're just looking at the brain here. Different parts of your brain do different things. Do you know which part of your brain controls eyesight, vision? Most common guess is right up here. It's the closest to your eyes. It's the most common incorrect guess the part that controls vision is actually back here. In the occipital lobe, or the visual cortex, it's the back of your head. And that's weird. Why is that the part that controls eyesight? I don't know. I didn't design your brain. But that's the part that all visual information is routed through first. There's another part right up here on top that controls motor function, meaning your muscles how you move your arms and legs, both big muscles and little fine ones, controlled right up there on top. It's about the size of your thumb. You got one on the right side of your brain and one on the left side of your brain. And the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa. Why is it that way? I don't know, didn't design your brain, but that's how it is. This part right up here in front, very important part, it's called the prefrontal or frontal lobe of your brain is in charge of thinking, cognition, rational thought, logic, problem solving. Also some fun things like personality and higher cognitive functioning like compassion and empathy and forgiveness. Hmm, those might be important later on. Short version is different parts of your brain do different things and there's a lot of different parts. Now part of your brain's job is to keep things really efficient. Because if you had to think about everything your brain is doing, you'd go nuts. It's in charge of what you think, what you feel, what you do, and all kinds of other things that you never even think about, like circulation and digestion and all of those things that are just handled in the background. It's a good thing we don't have to think about all of that. And the way your brain creates efficiency is through these neural pathways that I mentioned earlier. So let's take a common task like typing, for example. I call it typing, my kids call it keyboarding, <laughs> because now we have computers and they all have a keyboard, right? And you know how to do this. When you sit down at your computer, where is the G? Do you know? 
Isn't that weird to ask? Now you probably just looked at your keyboard or if you don't have a keyboard near you, you may have moved your hands to try to imagine a keyboard. Why do we do that? Because when we're typing, we're very used to just putting our hands in a position and then it's as if our fingers know where the keys are. Well, your fingers don't know anything. Your brain does. And it's your brain that controls your fingers, specifically the motor cortex which runs the muscles in your fingers. Well, how does this happen? Let's say that I wanted you to type the phrase, good morning. Now, if I were to show you that phrase, that it has to get into your brain somehow first. So let's picture a G right out here that you're looking at. Now, at this point, the G is nothing more than a pattern of light. As it enters your eye, it hits an organ called the retina. The retina is at the back of your eye and all it does is translate light into a nervous impulse because your nerves don't carry light. It's a chemical electrical stimulus, one neuron talking to another through the synapse and chemicals and electricity. So after it gets translated into a nervous impulse, it travels through your optic nerve, kind of along the base of your brain and it comes in back here somewhere near the visual cortex. Now, there's another part of your brain I didn't tell you about. It's a really fun part of your brain. It's located down here near the brainstem somewhere and it's called the reticular activating system. The reticular activating system has a lot of different roles, but one of those is kind of as a, a gatekeeper, a monitor. And so it's keeping track of all of the input and telling you what to pay attention to and what to ignore. Like the feeling of your shoes, for example. Oh, you can feel them now. Yeah, that's because I brought it to the attention of your reticular activating system. But usually it tells you, hey, you're typing. You've done this a good billion times. We don't have to bother the thinker about this. And then it shoots that signal from the visual cortex where it comes in straight up to the motor cortex. It's like a little shortcut that it takes. So you don't even have to think about it. Now, that's an oversimplification of how your brain is actually functioning, but it captures the idea that these neural pathways, as long as you practice it repeatedly, you can set up a little shortcut. Well, what if I gave you a little challenge to type your name using my keyboard. Now, what do you notice about this keyboard? Hmm, it's a little scrambled, isn't it? Would that be hard? Yeah, why? Because it's not where you're used to having the keys. So, if you're using my keyboard, and Incidentally, it takes about 48 seconds on the average for one of my clients to type their first and last name using my keyboard. Normally, it only takes a second, if that, right? So why does it take so long to type it on my keyboard? Some people tell me it's because the keys are in the wrong position. No, they're just in a different position. Notice that the keyboard you have is scrambled too. It's called a QWERTY keyboard. You know why? Because it starts with a Q. Q-W-E-R-T-Y. <laughs> Who says the alphabet that way? Nobody, but we've all learned it, so we think that that's the right way for it to be. Mine is just different. So using my keyboard, what happens? The G comes in here just like it always did, hits the retina, translating the lines, comes back here. Everything's all the same until you hit the reticular activating system when a little alarm goes off. And the alarm is all about, whoa, we can't use the old neural pathways. Something's different. And sometimes there's a little sense of panic that ensues at that moment. In psychology, we call this the oh crap response. And it happens any time that you get set off of your normal routine, your normal neural pathways. Well, when the alarm goes off, the traffic gets redirected basically. Signal gets sent up to the front for processing where your thinker has to figure it all out and tell you where to put your fingers now, usually one of those two. And then you can instruct one of those fingers through your motor cortex to type the letters. Do you see how this works? This is called a processing loop. It takes more time, it's less efficient. And your brain is basically lazy and loyal. It doesn't want to learn something new when it's already got a neural pathway. So it's gonna stick whatever you've been trained, taught, and educated to do, even if it's not the most ideal way to do it. Okay, that's gonna give us some clues as we work on changing habits, for example, or rewiring our brain. There's no wires in there to go mess around with. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna create new neural pathways. This is not easy. In fact, 
there's, there's a fun video on YouTube. You can look it up after you watch this one if you want to, about the backwards bicycle by Smarter Every Day. Amazing example of the same concept. If you were to learn to type on my keyboard, first of all, take a look again. Could you learn how to type on this? Yes. What would it take? And how do you know that, by the way? Because you learned how to type on the other one and it's scrambled too. So what would it take? Yeah, you nailed it. It's gonna take a whole lot of practice, isn't it? But there's another obvious but unnoticed piece to this. Do you want to learn how to type on my keyboard? No. It would be a horrendous waste of your time, wouldn't it? So that implies the other thing that's needed. You gotta have a strong enough why. What if Dr. Paul were to offer you $5,000 to learn how to type on my keyboard in the next two weeks? Would you take me up on that? Yeah, what changed? Your motivation, exactly. So you've gotta have a strong enough why, and then even if I were to offer you the five grand, you couldn't do it unless I let you take the keyboard home and practice on it, because it's gonna require both. Neural pathways are strong, and they resist change. When you encounter a new way of doing something or a new way of thinking, it's not going to come naturally to you at first. That's fine, don't be discouraged by that. Understand you've gotta give your, your mind a strong enough why, and then you gotta practice it enough that you actually establish a new neural pathway. That might take a while to do it, but it is absolutely possible. So that's a lot of brain science today at Live On Purpose TV. The scrambled keyboard, the backwards bicycle. I bet you can think of some other examples of neural pathways. Share them below. Let's get this conversation going.